And I just turned around and I hauled ass out of there. I was, I was done. I wasn't dealing with that. The hypocrisy of the cult is one of the things that turned me away the quickest. When I turned my headlights on, it turned and looked at us. And one of the things I remember the most were the eyes were glowing red. I see an orb of light. It is just circling these steps like it is waiting for me. And he begins to tell them uh, that he saw a UFO. They're basically like, what are you talking about? That's seven foot up on a tree, peeking around it. And that's where I saw the top of the muzzle, nose, and the eyes. As soon as I made eye contact with this thing, it felt like death. Welcome back to Tinfoil Tells. I'm your host, Brandon Wright. Tonight, we're going to be joined by my guest, Mr. Ron Moorhead. Anyone familiar with the Bigfoot community should know who Ron is. Back in the early 70s, they captured some very incredible evidence of vocal patterns from what is to believe to be Sasquatches chattering back and forth with each other. The Sierra Sounds is what it's been known to be referred to. It's been studied and researched through, and it's always held up. It's one very incredible piece of evidence. Before we bring Ron on, though, if you've ever had an experience and you'd like to be on an episode of Tinfoil Tells, there's two things you can do. You can go to tinfoiltells.com and go to the contact section. Or you can email me at tinfoiltellspodcast at gmail.com. Either way works. Just make sure to reach out and get your message to me. And we'll get something scheduled for a future episode. If you'd like to help the podcast out, please continue to share it. Every time you share the podcast, it opens up a new avenue for a potential new guest to come on. They may just discover the show and want to reach out and we go from there. You can also help out by leaving a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts at. If you happen to write one out on Apple, I'll try to find it and read it on an upcoming episode. You can also help out the podcast by going to the Patreon, becoming a foil fanatic. There are two different tiers. There's the free membership and then the paid membership. With the paid membership, you get access to all the episodes ad-free and all of the episodes that are not released yet, up to two months early. Both memberships give you access to Kringle Conspiracies, the Patreon-exclusive podcast, There's also some discounts for some merch and some other goodies on there too, so make sure to check out the Patreon. You can find more information about it in the show notes. There is a merch store available too. You can find more information about that included in the show notes as well. We'll be appearing at four different events this upcoming fall, beginning in September. On September 14th, I'll be at Bigfoots and Brews and Spirits 2 in Nawajack, Michigan at the Sister Lakes Brewing Company. That's being put on by Eric from Uncomfortable Podcast. And then on September 27th and 28th, I'll be in Nashville, Indiana for the first annual Bigfoot Conference. I'll have my vendor booth set up for both of those with my recording rig. So if you've had an experience and you'd like to stop by and talk to me, sure we can sit down and get something recorded. In October, I'll be appearing at ParaUnity 6 on October 19th in Miami County, Indiana at the 4-H Fairgrounds. And I'll also be appearing on October 26th at the first annual Crawfordville Paranormal Convention here in Crawfordville, Indiana. So make sure to mark those down. The Bigfoot conferences are paid to get in, so you'll have to get your tickets, which you can find more information about those in the show notes. The other two events in October are free to the public. All the events are all ages. And again, I'll have my recording rig at all the events, along with some shirts and some books and some other things. So make sure to stop by my booth, talk to me for a little bit. And if you would like to talk on an episode... And get something scheduled or we can record right there. But I think now we're going to go ahead and bring Ron on. Ron's been on my quote unquote bucket list for guests to talk to. So I'm definitely looking forward to diving in and talking with him. He's pretty much like the godfather of the Bigfoot community these days. So I'm really excited to talk to him. I really hope you guys enjoy the conversation. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'd like to take the time to welcome my guest tonight, Mr. Ron Moorhead. Ron, thanks for coming on here and talking to me. Well, thank you, Ron. I appreciate your invite and uh, look forward to it. Yeah, it's definitely a pleasure. I've 
I don't mean it to like sound insulting or but you're like the godfather of the Bigfoot community for most people. So it's an honor to have you on here because the Sierra sounds or whatever for anyone listening that they don't know who you are. Basically, I've heard the Sierra sounds years ago because that's always been one of the right after Patterson Gimlin, like that was the next thing that came out. So it's kind of a little bit of surreal knowing I'm mean, talking to the person that had the Sierra sounds recorded. Like it's a big, huge thing in the Bigfoot community. Yeah, it seems like it. I had no idea when this was happening to us. It happened to us more than once in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California that would evolve into something like this. Mm -hmm. I want to be talking about it because we we thought of them just as an unidentified ape in the woods, and, and when this coming on our camp at night, and and uh, but we started recording them and uh, getting some interesting vocalizations out of it. But it wasn't until we took a, a investigative reporter in there in 1972 that uh, that he started. Uh, uh, he was looking for a hoax, actually, trying to figure out who could be fooling us eight miles in the wilderness, 8,400 feet in elevation, way up in the mountains, and a really imposing trail, imposing place to get to. Once you get there, it's nice. So you just feel like laying out on a hot rock and enjoying, enjoying the weather when it's nice. But anyway, uh, he fostered the studies uh, on the sounds after he recorded them to see if there was any fun making, any maliciousness at all in them. And, Sent it to him. He finally found a guy at the uh, University of Wyoming, Dr. Lynn Curlin, who studied them unbiasedly for a year and uh, gave a paper on a report and uh, presented it to the Anthropology Unknown in British Columbia at Academia Hall, about 400 academias there, and showed that they were uh, speaking. They, they have a language, by the way. We found that out later. But he said they were, he, he's a sound engineer, by the way, a very high profile on several papers he's written. And he said their uh, their language uh, or whatever they're speaking is outside and inside uh, the human range, the average human range. And uh, one little bit that he studies represented an animal over eight foot tall. So that kind of made everybody perk up a little bit. But academia seems to have their mind made up that it has to be a rim of the Gigantopithecus or something, uh, something out there C couldn't have something like that. Because uh, anyway, it's uh, quite a quite a deal to have that done. 1978, I think it was when he gave that report. Came out in a book, "Man Like Monsters on Trial," and uh, it wasn't until 2008 till we had a crypto linguist uh, get a hold of him, and uh, by accident actually, and he drove all the way out from uh, Missouri, where he was teaching languages in a college there, to interview us just to see because he thought he heard thought he heard language in it, and. Uh, we didn't realize how significant that was, but uh, found out that having language by the human definition of language, like we're talking now, is very unique. It's unique to only humans. No other animal on the face of this planet, according to Dr. Philip Lieberman at uh, Brown University, a uh, uh, cognitive researcher, uh, scientist. He, uh, he says only humans have the vocal mechanism, which is a hyoid bone, the tongue into the nervous system, which tells your brain what to say and what you can say what you're seeing in other words mm -hmm. uh, dolphins communicate everything communicates but not with spoken language like we do so to me that puts them in a uh, that puts a human component in them because if only humans have that ability and these things have that ability and that's been established now by our recordings then uh, there is a human component to them so there's been two different geneticists that i know of that have found in the mitochondrial DNA uh, a hu human. And uh, academia has given them thumbs down because if it's human, it has to be uh, contaminated. Well, no, it doesn't. When you get deep into it, like I've done now for the last 50 years, I, I studied all the way. Uh, very, I was brought up, let me back up a little bit. I was brought up very religiously, and uh, I knew scriptures, and I, I knew the Bible. So my first place when I encountered these things up there in 1971 was I started researching biblical texts for uh, giants and where they came from, what they're doing, and could they be here now? Uh, that didn't really give me answers, so I got into the Book of Enoch, which is not canonized, but it's in the Ethiopian Bible, uh, which has 88 books instead of 66. And that, that took me a little ways back further, but then I had to find out where spoken language really started. And I went in all the way to Mesopotamia, where the Sumerians were, and it gets me into the cuneiform, uh, cuneiform texts, which... Uh, 
supposed to get into them by the Anunnaki. So that takes us even deeper into the subject. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of you or not, but uh, we just, mm-hmm. I'll just keep going until you ask me a question. No, you're fine. Like I said, I, I always I just let let you talk. Anyway, the sounds have been studied extensively. There's been no no debunking in them yet because there wasn't any uh, debunking. And uh, it's been that that program. Uh, the proof is out there. Just give them mm-hmm. a green light. Uh, another sound experts giving them green light, and also uh, another linguist, which was uh, heard him years and years ago, said said they're talking to each other. Well, still, she didn't have time to give us a full written report like like uh, Dr. Curlin did, uh, like uh, Scott Nelson did, the crypto linguist, who was a two time graduate of the uh, of the uh, Military Institute of uh, Foreign Languages in Monterey, California. And he, he, his whole career in the military was uh, transcribing sounds, whether it's a code or a language that's unknown or what, just to see what it could be, and then transcribing it. If it was a language, what could it mean? And he, he after he came out in 2008 and interviewed us, he, he wanted to study him too. So he went back and came back a few months later and said, these things have a language. So there you are. That, that kind of puts the human component in them where everybody's out there looking for the ape in the woods. And that's what we were doing for a long time because they look like an ape. They act like an ape but until they start talking. <laughs> They're not like yeah. an ape. They yeah. throw rocks too, so that's not like an ape. I did. Uh, go ahead. The one question I wanted to ask before we get into anything else, what originally had you guys going out there? Like, was okay. it because... Like you went out there and you heard the noises and everything. What actually was the real reason you guys were out there originally when you yeah. had your first encounter with it? Well, that's where I should have started, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was five hunters all together. They were all my friends. I wasn't a hunter at the time, but two of the brothers, the Johnson brothers, went up early in the year and, and encountered this something. They thought it was a bear at first because they had been uh, frequenting that site and hunting that site uh, since 1958. So quite a... Uh, Quite an imposing area, but uh, like I say, this was, you know, never came out without the game that they had a tag for. And so uh, they came out with a story about some kind of a monster up there to the other three guys, and they all went back up to see what would happen if anything's still around or see what it could be because, like I say, they were all going to church. They are all kind of uh, religious-minded, I should say. But one guy who got up there, he, he just got freaked out with the sounds because they sound pretty aggressive when they first encountered them in 71. And he he left a note next morning. He said, I got to get out of here. He was just frightened, really out of his wits almost. And he went back down the valley where the families were and he he talked, told the wives what the Johnson brothers said, if there's true, there's some kind of a monster up there. And they said, well, you got to go back. The guys aren't out. And they should have came out by now. I never wouldn't know if they'd been eaten or what could have happened to them. They got killed or because they didn't know. They didn't know what they was dealing with. Bigfoot was not on anybody's radar at the time. So hunting camp, that's what they went there for. And uh, so he said, well, I'll go back, but I'm not going to go back by myself. So that's how I got involved. And I knew them, and he asked me to go with him. So I went with him. Got in there. The guys were okay. So we... Anyway, I saw my first track. I heard some of the recording. They took a tape recorder up, so I heard the recording they made. And anyway, I started going back up as much as I could get somebody to go with me, and I just started visiting the camp as much as possible. And I did for years and years. I'd go up there just as often as I could. And uh, But anyway, uh, my story, the only thing that makes it unique is, is the fact that it's not just my word. We've got the science behind these sounds that we recorded, showing they're outside the human range. And uh, what frequencies they can get to, we don't know because we weren't recording infrasound. All we had was cassette recorders. So that's all we hauled in. That's all we used. And that's all was available, portable then. But we got some pretty good recordings. And uh, that's what I wrote about. And that's what I've uh, recorded and produced. And so, anyway, that's how I got into it. And I've uh, been chasing it ever since all over the world. I've been into Peru, Bolivia. I've been into uh, Nepal into uh, Siberia, Russia, uh, quite a, quite a bit of a run around chasing this anomaly. It's just a uh, pretty unique once it gets a hold of you, and once mm-hmm. you find out. As we were in, experiencing some other things up there too, besides just the vocalizations, and that's that's what gets me into looking deeper because whatever these things are, they they 
they're unique and they know things we don't we haven't evolved into or something because they just uh, seem to be evasive. You get around every trap you trick, every, every trick you try, I should say the yeah. better way to put it. And uh, we set up the traps, camera traps, all kinds of things, trying to get a picture. I never could, never could trick them that way. They'd go around the camera trap like they knew what you was doing. We couldn't believe that, but they would. Or they'd bat the camera off, we'd flash and go off. And so we didn't know what we were dealing with until uh, really, even now, we don't know for sure. But I got some pretty good ideas after studying this thing all over the world and and evaluating what's going on with us. Because we had, we had, like I heard a car door slam right out this side. Now, how do you explain that when there's no cars can even possibly get up there? And then like it's mimicking sound. the sound. Well, whatever's making sound, it wasn't a car door. <laughs> yeah. that could have been. I just think you hear a herd of horses running down towards camp or something. That's not that happening. You know, we had horses up there, but they were tied up. And uh, sometimes I thought you hear a big metallic sound out, outside. You, you, this daytime, sometimes you go out and look and you can't find the source of it. It's just a big wooey sound. And uh, another time we thought our camp was being tore apart, the sound of cans and everything else from the barrels that we'd hauled in on our horses and mules and we had them strapped down <laughs> close them at night but yet you think something's tearing them apart and uh, you look out there later when all the course is done and nothing's changed well where do you put that how does your brain fit <coughs> excuse me yeah. uh the uh the conditioned brain that we have it's it's a Something we're born with, and we it, it's taught what we've what has been taught through schooling, through the people that's raised us. Uh, we're all conditioned to believe certain ways. So your brain tries to fill in those holes when with what it does know, and uh, that was happening with us. We're trying to figure out what could could this be? How could that possibly be? Could they be hypnotizing us all? Uh, could they? What? How do they do this? What they're doing? Lights would follow us around. One time I saw. I did. I saw a UFO coming down from up there one time and got lost it behind the trees. But this was all the all the Bigfoot stuff was happening in the early 70s. And it kind of continued on from 71, 72, all the way into 76. And then the close-up stuff stopped. After that, uh, we only had uh, distant stuff happening that we could hear. And we'd have uh, maybe uh, lights happening that we couldn't identify but we didn't have the vocalizations coming around close to us anymore. But in 1976, we we shot a bear in camp, which was uh, tearing up our barrels, tearing up our, not our barrels, but our packs full of food that we packed in on mm -hmm. mules. And we didn't want that. So we had to go out and run it off and it ended up coming back a couple of times. The third time it came back, we went out with our guns loaded and and it reared up. It was just gonna. It, it didn't run off that time. It came back at us, so we shot it and then skinned it out the next day. And that's kind of a weird looking thing when you skin out a bear. It looks like a little person, you know. <laughs> and I say a little person, it wasn't little, but uh, they're strong and they're they can be aggressive, but they're not like a black bear is not generally aggressive at all. They'll screw away. You know, we see a lot of bear up there. They're not like the grizzlies up in Alaska or the brown bear. Uh, Anyway, uh, things still happen. The last time something happened with me was in 2011. I say the last thing I heard vocalizations was in 2011. And uh, I, I uh, had some other things happen that night, too. I was up there by myself, which really shouldn't do. But I've been up there three times with the crypto linguist trying to get some more sounds that we could record. And nothing had happened. Well, I he had to go back to work in Missouri. So I, I said, well, I got to go back up and find out. They're still around because nothing we could firmly identify. Things happen, but nothing you could really that I put my hat on. You know, the doctor really affirmed it was a Bigfoot. And uh, he uh, he left. Okay, I went back up. Had a guy scheduled to go with me, but he backed out the last minute. So I, I was in good shape. So I walked in and uh, stayed there. I took enough power bars last me for three days. And and that afternoon, I heard a big whop, a big tree knock. I thought it was at the time, right outside. This little tent I'd set up, and I started. Uh, uh, I went out and started talking to it because it was definitely one of them. I mean, I say definitely. I didn't see it, but you rarely see these things, and that's. I got some science behind why you don't see them too. Here in a few minutes, we'll talk about that. But 
anyway, it it, uh, it stopped. It never came out. Let me see it like I asked it to. And uh, uh, that night, I checked out my tape recorder. Had all brand new lithium batteries in it. Everything's working fine. Well, ten o'clock that night, I, I heard the chatter going on, and I I tried to record it. My batteries was dead. The tape recorder wouldn't work. And I heard this thing tromping around right at the side of my tent. I'd set up and and uh, I started talking to it again from inside the tent. And I said, uh, told you not to come back here at night and, and scare me because it's a little bit concerning. You don't know what these things are going to do, but you know they're huge and they can do pretty much anything they choose to about that time. But all I had was a little thirty-eight with a birdshot in it to scare the bear off because it's a bear. And I never considered shooting one of these things unless I was attacked. And we usually all, always carried high power guns with us, but the last few years up there, I didn't feel like I needed that. Uh, so anyway, um, I didn't get much sleep that night. Uh, whatever it was, walked up by side by tent, bipedal talk, walk, and I never heard it go away, but it, it must have went away because it didn't make any more sounds. About four o'clock that morning, I heard this metallic sound going on outside my tent. I, I write about this in my first book, uh, Voices in the Wilderness. It's my chronicle of doing this stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, this uh, metallic sound was really strange. I, I couldn't remember and I couldn't record it. And uh, uh, as soon as the sun came up, I folded up that little tent I was sleeping in and packed up my power bar and took back out. <laughs> but I think that one walking around my uh, Soberry there where my tent was, uh, I think he was looking for food because we used to leave food out all the time. I always have. And I, that night I didn't because I really didn't start the stove up even. I didn't even have a fire going that night, just me. And I thought, well, these things are already around because when that wood knock happened, which I thought was a wood knock, it was still daylight outside. And uh, that's that's kind of unusual. Cause it's, but now in retrospect, I look back at how loud that was. It, it, I'm not sure it was a wood knock. It sounded like a gun going off right next to my tent. Uh, you said you heard metal sound. Did it sound like metal scraping? Like no. No, it wasn't metal scraping. It was metallic, like a electrical. Uh, I can't even explain it. It was just, uh, I, I was hoping to remember that. I'd be able to record it or something, but I couldn't. Just uh, metallic sounds. And uh, uh, it wasn't metal scraping, but it was just, uh, I don't know how else to explain it. I've heard other people talk about when they've had experiences, not just like with Sasquatch, but other things. They say they hear like a metallic sound but it's almost like something scraping almost like a metal door like scraping against something so that's... well it could have been some of that i again i just can't put my finger on it. i just know yeah. I, I was making notes so that's what you want to do when you're out like that and i wrote down metallic and that's what i remember <laughs> metal sounding uh, electrical no. all together so what it was i don't know but it was sort of different and nothing up there would have made that sound uh, that we know of Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, this has taken me into a, a, a lifelong research of this phenomena all over the world, and and uh, I have come to some some kind of a uh, kind of some conclusions that they're not all the same. Uh, these things uh, are not. You can't just say Bigfoot and, and, and cover everything that's around the world, like in Nepal and and China and uh, these different places, Siberia, where they have encounters. They say with the wild man and all that stuff, well, they're not the same. Their, their personalities aren't the same. They don't have the same type of tracks necessarily. And uh, it gets, gets me into the deeper part of, uh, of uh, where we came from, what we're all about. And that's why I was asking earlier how spiritual you were, because there is other dimensions. I got it with my second book, The Quantum Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And that, that gets into the scientific part of what could answer the woo and the paranormal stuff that people are talking about. People used to call me a woo-wooer because I got into that, but I found out quantum physics is, is a science recognized all over the world. So it's not the woo, it's not the paranoid. It's, it answers those questions that those things present to people. Because when they can't explain something, they don't. They, they call it the paranormal or the woo. Which is okay if they want to do that, but quantum science will answer a lot of those questions, and so it got me into it. Al Berry, who was an investigative reporter we took in in 1972, he had a master's degree in science, and he said, 
don't talk about the weird stuff up here. You won't get to talk anywhere about this. And him and I started going around talking about this years ago. And he passed away in 2012, though. He became a good friend. And anyway, uh, it's been a, a quite an adventure, uh, really. Uh, so it's taken me a lot of places and made me read a lot. And uh, took me all, all the way into uh, the depths of uh, where we came from as human beings and where, where the facts lead us. And it led me, actually, to the oldest known written language known to mankind, and that's the cuneiform text, which is uh, transcribed or translated by the uh, by the Sumerians in Mesopotamia. And uh, it gets back to 3400 BCE, and uh, it's, uh, it's noted on thousands of clay tablets of how they wrote. And uh, those things got translated into English in the 1800s, and uh, what they do is they pretty much uh, mimic what a lot of the biblical things say. I mean, the first few chapters of Genesis in the Bible uh, talk about, you know, how this happened first day, that happened second day, da, 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 da. The cuneiform text goes back millions of years and how, how old men used to be. We used to be a lot older, you know, until our the telomeres got severed by something alien, I imagine. And we can believe in aliens. I know I asked you earlier before we came on, do you believe mm -hmm. in aliens? And you don't know, but uh, I think it's it's almost ridiculous. Well, the government says we can now, right? Yeah. <laughs> they said they said it wasn't a really a weather balloon in Roswell. <laughs> so it was a weather balloon. Well, no. Anyway, uh, aliens are out there. They've been hybridizing this planet for eons and eons. And I think a lot of these, uh, what they call Bigfoot or Yeti or something like that, have been uh, have been hybridized by alien intervention into the genome of a species on this planet. And they've been given different attributes depending on the agenda of the species that made them, which is uh, alien species. Been no tells how many alien species have visited this planet, and I've seen remnants of them from different parts of the world that I've been to. And it's undeniable that uh, down in Peru and Bolivia, it's really opened my eyes up because I've seen these megalithic structures that that we can't even figure out how they did it today. I think a lot of it goes right back in the sound vibration, uh, moved by sound. Uh, they, some of these boulders are over 100 tons, well over 100 tons, and they moved up on this 13,000-foot mountain, put together like a jigsaw puzzle with no, no mortar at all. So it kind of opened my eyes up. Then I've seen remains of them. In fact, I got one of them right there. You see that? Mm-hmm. Uh, your listening audience can't see that, but it's a, it's an elongated skull. Yeah, and uh, I was down there researching those with a couple of different scientists, a couple of different times, uh, weighing them and see what the difference was. And they're not human; they're uh, <clears throat> they have about a thirty percent more brain mass area because they only have a they have a single parietal, which is we have two parietals, you know, two brain mass, one on each side of our head. The sagittal suture going down there, they don't have a sagittal suture, and. Uh, Two little pinholes right in the back of it, too. I kind of made light of that, thinking they were antennas, but I kind of doubt that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I was down there, uh, like I said, a couple of times with uh, Brian Forrester, who uh, uh, lives there in Paracas, Peru. Went up in the high country and studied a lot of that stuff and did a lot of uh, investigating there. So that's that opens your eyes up, that kind of stuff like that. And That's happening all over the world. People are seeing that stuff. And uh, uh, Malta's another one. But I get off on these subjects, man. So if you want to just ask me a question, just jump in there and ask it. But I, I, when you started delving into the Cuneiform text and the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki were star people, they call them. And just about all cultures have that in their legacy, their core belief. People came from the sky and, mm -hmm. and gave us this or told us that. Uh, they were also uh, shiny ones. Even Satan in the Bible is called a shiny one. But I believe, I believe them to be what the Bible calls the fallen angels, or the fallen ones, the ones that left out of the dimension they were in and, and, and went into our third dimensional environment. We live in a third dimensional environment, and uh, that's just what we have to do is go through time as we see it, because uh, we think there's a tomorrow coming. And we're pretty sure there was a yesterday, but we have to learn to live in the now, I think, and that's that's kind of important, I believe. Uh, it gets deeper and deeper as we go. Uh, it's called the rabbit hole by some people. <laughs> yeah. But it's a fact. I mean, the cuneiform tablets 
are a fact. They're written, most all written languages came, have a core in that, in that written text uh, from uh, Sumerian tablets. So even the Hebrew Bible does. And you find issues, I did anyway. I, started, I got a Hebrew translation, started finding errors in there. And one error that sticks out in my mind, one of the first ones I found was uh, the Bible says it's easier for me a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is a rich man to go to heaven or something like that. And uh, anyway, I started looking up the word for rope, and in the, in the Hebrew text, it's, it's spelled, I mean, excuse me, the rope, rope and camel are spelled exactly the same way. So that's just a little mistake. I, it sounds more reasonable for someone to say it's easier for a rope to go through the eye of a needle than a camel. Yeah. I, I get off on that because I've found a few other things like that. But I just think that uh, we ought to consider and get our minds uh, focused outside the box that we've been conditioned in. And we've all been conditioned, like I said before. Until you get outside that box, and I relate it to a parachute that doesn't open, uh, you're going to hurt when it hits. So you need to understand that quantum physics is, is the core of the or how everything works in this universe from the atom all the way through the cosmos, according to uh, Professor uh, Christopher Breyer at West Texas A&M. So what happens? A lot of people call these things uh, interdimensional. A lot of people call them this, that, and the other, but they're not all the same. I think a lot of them have crossbred with indigenous people. It's, that's a lot of their lore. And uh, they uh, say they live in two worlds. Well, how does that figure? What does that mean? Uh, can they go out of our three-dimensional environment? You see, everything is energy, frequency, and vibration, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Okay, well, if everything's energy, frequency, and vibration, and it is, that's that's pretty much established. You find the frequency of anything, you can change its matter. Now, Einstein says that. Okay, then here comes Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, Florida, yeah. Anyway, he got the Nobel Prize in 1933 for antimatter. And uh, Barack, Dirac, Paul Dirac, <laughs> there it mm -hmm. is. And uh, antimatter, which is the direct exchange between energy, energy and matter. Matter and energy are interchangeable. Well, that's kind of interesting. Then you had CERN in 2012, which had a hydron collider where they collided two particles and turned into energy. Now, you can't see energy, but you can sense it. They sensed energy there. So that was established. And now energy and matter are interchangeable. That's established as a fact. Okay, if these things we call Bigfoot that we were dealing with in the Sierras can somehow reach the frequency that would change their matter into energy, that would cause them to go out of our perception, which our perception is a, a light's frequency, which is light's frequency is 430 to 770 terahertz. So when you fall out of that, you don't see anything else because that's light's frequency. We're sitting here in the dark right now, you wouldn't see much. That's light's frequency. Now, cats, animals, some of them can see better than we can. Sometimes a, a, a camera's eye will take in more than what we can see with our eyes. We have limitations as humans, as our human conditioning is a human component. We we don't uh, see what we're, everything there is to be seen. We don't... Uh, hear everything there is to hear. We don't hear infrasound or ultrasound. We don't smell. Our olfactory sense is not as good as a bear, which is 20 times better than ours. So we have to understand our human conditioning here, how we have been, how we are as humans, and realize when you go out in the woods that you're not going to see everything, you're not going to hear everything, and you're not going to smell everything. So really, you have to get into a little bit of just not biology, but get into a uh, quantum physics to see how things can disappear, and things can disappear if they go out of your frequency. So, you find the frequency of anything, you can change its matter. That's supposedly a fact. So I think that's how miracles are done from from the shaman, from different masters from the old. Uh, they, find, they know the frequency, and it's automatic for some, and it has to be earned by others. I think we have the ability to do a lot of this stuff, but we haven't evolved into it yet. So or if we have, we've been dumbed down, so we don't do it anymore. Well, we've absolutely been dumbed down. <laughs> we've dumbed yeah. down the apple for the Garden of Eden or whatever that was. Mm. Uh, yeah, they because they, they made us when they made us. By the way, the Anunnaki made us. <clears throat> They're not all bad. 
and uh, we're made in the image, as even the Bible says, let us make man in our image. Well, a lot of religions will say that's body, soul, and spirit. Well, it may be so, but may, there's more. There's a lot more. And they, they get you into, they made us too good. Like they was afraid we was going to, by living so long, and we were living hundreds and hundreds of years back then. Well, they said, these these guys are going to get too smart. They're going to be like us. So we got to change that. So they changed our telomeres and shortened our lifespans to 120 years. So that's why we don't live as long as we used to. And our telomeres have been clipped and severed, and there we are. So make the most out of this life because you're going to have it. You got to learn everything you can from this life. That kind of Go brings ahead. up another question. Okay, good. Com you need some questions for me. <laughs> completely unrelated to the Bigfoot or whatever, but like, so if we're creating everything, do you believe that there is an afterlife? Or we're just uh, afterlife? here? Or yeah, we're just here life. and then our energy, our, which I'm sorry. Go ahead and ask your question. Was, okay. Basically, it's, it's, if we die, where's our energy go? Well, there you go. No one knows. Yeah. If you're a religion, you think you're going to go to heaven. If you're a physicist, you're going to change forms, according to Einstein. But it doesn't, energy can't, can't be created and it can't die. And that's that's been proven mathematically. So in order to disprove it, you have to disprove it mathematically, and it's never been disproved. So uh, energy can't die. So that means we've been here before. That means you may be here again if you haven't learned your lessons. And that just uh, you go on and on. So really, there's no such thing as death. It's called a passing on and changing forms. Uh, that's what happens. And that goes against a lot of religions. It goes against how I was raised religiously, but it's just the way it pretty much has to be. If you're going to believe in science and believe in spirituality, like uh, Tesla said, well, one man calls God, no one calls the laws of physics. So physics and spirituality are pretty much synonymous. And uh, I quote a lot of scientists in my book because I think it all comes down to those credible people that are talking and have written things and proven things that we need to pay attention to. But you got to get outside the condition box in our brain. There's a way to do that. I think there's Success. a lot of stuff that's out there that I feel like maybe more people are starting to wake up towards certain things, but then... I get on Facebook and then I just shake my head because I think we're getting smarter than that. <laughs> and then I realize within two seconds, no, we're still pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Well, we're not so stupid. We just, we just been, yeah, messed with and, uh, we've, uh, we got a lot to learn and a lot yeah. to go into, but I think you do that. Uh, we have something in our, in our brain and inside of our head besides well, the, the square box that, called the ethereal part, and that's the pineal gland, which I think is a receptor. It's the eye of Horus that the Egyptians dictate a lot. And uh, it's, it's the third eye that a lot of uh, Indians are to talk about. Uh, but that, that third eye is a receptor for the oneness that we all are, and that's how you receive your gut feeling because it's a direct down connection to your heart. Your heart has a brain. Your heart has a brain. Let me say it again. Our heart has a brain. And that brain gets a gut feeling. That that's what they call a gut feeling. That something's mm -hmm. wrong. Something's going to go, and it'll tell your head, your conditioned head, which says, "No, that can't be. Let's fill in those holes. That can't be." Uh, it'll say, "Oh, go over there and help old Mrs. Jones or something." And yet over here, you see, two thousand dollars you can make in an hour. Well, you want to go over there where the two thousand dollars are, but your gut feeling says, "Go help Mrs. Jones." So. You need to, we need to learn how to be compassionate and deal with love and compassion. And that's not religion, that's spirituality. And you need to help Mrs. Jones if that's what your heart's saying to do. I don't, I don't know if Mrs. Jones are listening right now or not. <laughs> <If you are. laughs> I hope someone's ready to help you. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking like when you're talking about things that um, you ever... I don't know how this relates. It probably, I don't know if it does or not, but like deja vu, I've always felt weird about. I get it a lot. I yeah. just had it. I just had it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And every time it happens, I get like a weird, like a weird queasiness. My hair stands up on my, get goosebumps. Like, <laughs> because it's like, you know, I've what's going to happen? 
Yeah, like I've seen this before. Like I know yeah, what's yeah. going on, and I hate that. Uh-huh. <laughs> and oh, no, you should love it. I can't explain it. Like so, it drives well, me so, crazy. Let me tell you. You ready? Because time, as we perceive it, does not exist. Everything's in the now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so when something happens like that, it's like a little jump in time warp. Uh, we have a. Uh, I've had deja vu's. And I, it was scary sometimes, but all of a sudden, you learn to relax your brain. Don't let your brain start talking out of anything. Just relax it. You'll know more and more and more what's fixing to happen. And that's fun because then you really can tell the future. <laughs> well, I wish I could get it for when the lottery numbers. Are you can't help out. but thinking when that happens. You just can't yeah. help but thinking. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's fun though. I ask people how many have had a deja vu. About everybody has deja vu. They don't know how to explain it. Was well, because time, as we perceive it, don't exist. Tomorrow, you think it's going to happen, but it doesn't exist yet. And yesterday, don't exist. Because we're in the now. The only thing that exists is you and I talking right now and things we see around us. The only thing that makes that exist is the fact that this we're in the light frequency. A lot there. of people <laughs> have kind of went off into, I don't want to call it the matrix type idea, but like a lot of people think we're in a simulation. And I've even contemplated the way things are, especially scientifically, like, if there's other dimensions of this and that, I said, basically I look at it from like a video game perspective. Like if we're on the third level, we're on 3d and there's different dimensions. So you go up into the fourth dimension, like that's level four of the game. And then like these things, these entities, these could be aliens, creatures, whatever you want to call them. These energies from other dimensions come into our worlds. Like they're coming into our level. And at some point <laughs> I've talked with people say that we can achieve this level, then after we die, we go into the next level. I was like, so that that's their way of talking about how the afterlife is. Our energy goes up to a different level. Mm-hmm. And when you talk it's about pre- levels or frequencies, and it, it, it all comes yeah. back sounding very simulated to me. It almost sounds like electronically like a game again, because you're going back on frequencies, energies. Well, but it's not a game. It's real. It's realistic. Yeah. Uh, we live in third dimension and, uh, you go out of this and do what they call time. Some people call it time. It's the fourth dimension. I think that's where a lot of people see ghosts and you know, different things like that. It depends on the temperature and get into the ethereal realm of the frequency, really. Everything is frequency. So I think aliens are in the fifth and sixth dimension. And uh, that's just where I think we're headed for when this body dies. If, if you haven't learned what you're supposed to learn through love and compassion on this planet, then you're going to have to experience it somewhere because... You want to be part of this universe. You got to be have that as your core, blue, as your core fundamental values. And if you haven't learned it once, you're gonna to have to learn it again. And uh, you can either come back here, or you can uh, go to another planet and learn it with a, or as a three dimensional environment where you get to make choices. It's all about the experiences and the choices you make, and we have to make them based on love and compassion, not on hatred or vengeance or or uh, anything like that. It's, it's We're a warring species, so it's kind of automatically for us to to want to hurt somebody that hurts us, but uh, we're not we're not really supposed to do that. We're supposed to try to understand them and try to... I tell people, uh, you, you're going to call in what you... Whatever you talk about and believe is what you're going to call into your life. And uh, I know uh, you think negativity, negative all the time, and speak it, Watch so purpose day and night. Uh, you're gonna <clears throat> you're gonna live in that world, and uh, that's not gonna teach you a thing until you start learning how to care for other people and do right by other people, no matter what they've done to you. Because what they've done to you is their karma, not your karma. Our karma is to uh, graduate, to get through this three dimensional environment, and graduate up to the sixth, through the fifth, through the fourth. Uh, if you don't, you're gonna be stuck in one of those, and you're gonna have to learn it again somewhere. That's called multiple embodiments. And uh, I think we're made in the image of the ninth dimensional beings, which is the Anunnaki. That's what they were, the shiny ones. And that's what we're headed for. That's what we're supposed to be headed for. But you can't get there until you've learned the rudimentary uh, core of the universe, which is love, and how to deal with other people compassionately. I sound like a preacher, don't I? (laughs) Do you believe in the lower frequency beings i know when you mentioned negativity i've talked to several different people that believe they're 
lower frequency beings. One guy thinks that hell, like the biblical version of hell, is basically like a lower frequency. It's dark. It's cold. Mm -hmm. like, well, hell's always seem to be like it's hot. He's like, you ever heard of? You've touched something and it, and it froze you to like it feels like a freezer burn. Like you ever gotten like that? But that is a uh, or rationale for explaining lower frequency beings basically almost like the evilness the demonics or whatever you want to call them they so claim those are the uh low frequency beings that bring in the negativity and they feed on our negativity yeah yeah they will if you're negative they're gonna feed on that i went out into a, a dogman uh, research center in uh, south of here and uh, they've been claiming they've been seeing dogmen. They've been molesting people and different things like that. So one of the guys is a 30-year veteran of the deputy uh, sheriff's department. And he he saw one face-to-face, -face and he just he's a firm 100% believer in that. Well, I say if it can be Bigfoots all over the world, there could be a dogman too. You know, Because if aliens are manipulating the genome of different species, why not a dog or a wolf or something? When, so, I, anyway, when I told uh, you off air... That I'd saw something. I I didn't say what it was, but it was an upright walking canine in two thousand and seven. Well, you might have seen a dog man. What state was that in? In Indiana. Indiana, yeah. Four miles from where I live right now. I go down that road every almost every day, and I've never seen it before. I've never seen it since. But well, I've heard a lot of people say they're aggressive, but I think they they don't. I don't know what made them. You know what species made them, but uh, there's different alien species on this planet now. I think some of them live in the ocean, some of them live in deep caves down under the ground. Uh, I think uh, reptilians, uh, what they call them, uh, live in under the ground mm -hmm. in cave systems. And uh, Bigfoot, I'm not sure, but it depends on how dilated they are because a lot of them are crossbred, so they become more human-like than others. And they've been here, like I say, for eons. They were here before we were because the Anunnaki created them first as slave laborers. And... Uh, then they created us because that wasn't good enough what they made. Uh, it gets even better. I talk about this stuff in my last book, uh, Bigfoot Unveiled. I get into dimensions and to, uh, like I think that's what Tesla's three, six, and nine is. You have to go through the third dimensional uh, to understand the universe, according to, to Tesla. If you understand three, six, and nine, you understand the universe. Well, that hit home with me. I've heard never heard anyone else say it like this, but it just came to me like this, so I could be wrong, but it sounds makes sense to me. The third dimension is what we're in now. You have to understand what that's all about and how to react to that before you can go on to the sixth. Sixth dimension is where they say you can create things and do things. You can uh, telepathically communicate all the time. However, we're made to go to the ninth dimension, which means you've got to learn more even. Because we're made in the image of the Anunnaki, which is the ninth dimensional beings. So that's the three, six, and nine. I think if we understand those those core things. I think you can graduate and keep graduating as long as you enhance those beliefs and, and live them. But we live in a, you say, matrix. Could be. The science says nothing's real till it's observed. Well, wow. How do you get your head around that? <laughs> we're thinking because we're looking at something right now. It's real. Well, it's only real because your light, your eyes are observing, and they're they're only seeing a reflection. They're not seeing the real thing. <laughs> you mentioned three six nine. I'm trying to get my Google to work, and it's being very slow. That's um, called a manifestation code, not called <laughs> Tesla. Well, I'm tr it for whatever reason, like you know, the Inferno, Dante's Inferno, or whatever. He had to go through all these different levels in that book and obviously it was a work of fiction or whatever but how many levels did he have to go through as well i was trying to figure out because i thought it was like three six and nine although that was something to do with that book hmm. and that was wrote obviously a long time before tesla but again i typed it in and my internet's not loading so well, i tell you but i never read that books <laughs> I, I never read it either i just i know the story of it and i know he had to the gist of it was he had to go through all the layers of hell to get back to uh, like to trying to save the soul of the woman that he loved or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I could be a compl completely off base. I've never read it, but I know there were certain stages, certain levels of that he had to travel through. And I thought there was like nine levels of hell that he had to go through. Oh, interesting. So, and you're talking well, about uh, different yeah, levels I, of 
like different I, dimensions or whatever. And you said nine. I was like, I wonder if that had anything to do with why he wrote the book that way. I was raised in ministers that used to preach hell and damnation and all that stuff. And I used to ask myself, well, wait a minute, Satan's supposed to be destroyed in the end. Who's going to be in charge of hell if all this stuff's supposed to be good? Uh, but th there's no answer for that. Uh, my, because <laughs> my biggest hang up on religion. I was raised in a Pentecostal church, but I always go back to if you believe in your the Bible and you believe in everything it says, if God created everything, God had to create Satan and the angels that rebelled against him. And if he's the all-knowing God, he knew they were going to rebel against him, so therefore he knew he was creating evil and it was going to happen. He didn't give them free will, but he gave man free will, so how could he create something that was going to rebel against him if he didn't give it free will? So that's where well, the loophole comes in for me and it gets confusing. I disagree with part of that. I think everything has a free will. Aliens have a free will. And Anaki had a free will when they decided to come on down to Earth and mess with the genomics of our species and different species on the planet. So they have a free will because they were supposed to have been destroyed in the flood, but yet they were here 400 years later in the land of Canaan. And uh, mm -hmm. you started looking at that stuff. And actually, there was a, if you really get into it, and I, I really hesitate on getting on this because it, it really, a lot of religions will frown on it, but. Uh, in the cuneiform text, there's over 10,000 of those. Every time the word God, which isn't said God, is called Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, Elohim. Every time that's mentioned, it's mentioned in plural form. Plural form. More than one, plural form. Yet, somehow through the ancients, through the times, through the translations, man, and man with his conditioned brain, has changed it into singular when he gets... He thinks that's got to, it makes more sense that way. Because, uh, so I, I come to believe that hell is our, our, ourselves. We are hell. If we can't get out of this third dimensional environment, our, our negativity is, is hell for us. And our positive, the, the good can't serve two masters. The master, you're either going to serve yourself, or you're going to serve the oneness that we're all part of. So when you get into the oneness that we're all part of us, the pineal gland I mentioned earlier, and you become one with that, even like Christ said, I wish that all could be one with the Father as I'm one with the Father. Well, we all need to be one like we really are, but we haven't learned how to graduate from the heart's mind into the thing sitting on our shoulders. And we have it conditioned so much that you can't get out of that sometimes. Some people can't. I mentioned, I tried to give my presentation to a church group a time or two, and they don't go for it at all. You see them all sitting out there with their arms crossed, you know. So I just stop that. You know, I talk on podcasts like this all the time, <laughs> speak at conventions because you find people got more of an open mind in those places, and yeah. and they'll they'll, uh, they'll listen to you because what I say, uh, well, to me, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, hell never met didn't make sense. It just never did. It's it's a man made contraption for religions to control. And that's what religion does. Is now, I'm not saying religious people aren't bad. They're just the good people. It's just been brainwashed. <laughs> that's that's kind of where I get into it with people too. And I think I make majority of my family and whoever else is super religious <laughs> mad. But like I've said, religion is used as a way to control people these days. Yeah, it like is. It's, it's not about. I said not the the belief and everything. I'm glad people have a belief and stuff. And that's why I said I'm not a religious person. I believe that there is something created us. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to say it's like the God of whatever religion or whatever. There was something was our creator and it could yeah. be what you're talking about. It. And it is. Yeah, I think. Yeah. But I feel like we're stuck and blinded by the indoctrination we get from religions and what we're being told. To, this is how it is. Like no one, thinks outside the box anymore. Everyone looks at their phone 24 seven. Like we're, we're being dubbed down to just condition of what they want us to know. That's why I wrote this book right here, Brian, just because of that. It, it, what one man calls God, no one calls the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. You got spirituality and quantum physics on the same plane because you can't see the one of them. Right there. Yet they exist. So I just like to say that about that is that, you know, we're here for the experience and make the most out of it because we only have the now, we don't have tomorrow.
We don't have mm -hmm. yesterday anymore. So make the most of the now and do good with it. And you will be on the right. You'll be great. You'll be graduating. Your frequency gets higher. We're on our we're on the way to our fifth dimension right now. And uh, I think the whole Earth is, except for certain warring parts. But the Earth is trying to ride. It's it's a it's an energy form too. And it's uh, I, I read where it was. It used to be in the fifth dimension, but it went down to the third dimension when when the uh, fallen ones, the Anunnaki, the fallen Anunnaki, uh, started changing the species and making them more species. And uh, that's what we that's what we are. But we got to get out of that. We got to raise our vibration. We got to start thinking better and doing better and stop hurting people. And that's going to get us into a higher plane and a better vibration and get us out of here in good shape. I say get us out of here. Hmm. Most people won't get out of here. Completely off topic, but I feel like it's relevant to this. Well, it is because if Bigfoot has a human component, where'd they come from? You know, there's, they don't fall in the Darwin category. Yeah. What yeah. I was going to ask is, uh, so if we were created from the Anunnaki and everything, what, what were, I know a lot of religious people, and I don't want to upset anyone, but basically the creationist side, they think the Earth's only 6,000 years old, and I think that's whatever. Go ahead, BS, but, go ahead, say they, they, they don't believe in <laughs> dinosaurs or anything like that. So, how many years ago do you honestly think that these Anunnaki came down here? Like, when did all that happen? Oh, gosh. You know, that's up for grabs because it's probably hundreds of thousands of years. So it's, uh, aliens have been busy here. Mm -hmm. uh, they started a hybridization program. I don't know when. I just know the Younger Dryas, which is 12,000 years ago. That's what we're coming out of now. And uh, it's just... Uh, Things are changing rapidly on this face of this planet right now. That's why UFOs are being seen more because even the Bible says I was, and Christ said I was in the days of Noah, so should also be in the second coming. Well, the second coming is is now, and we're seeing it. We're seeing the uh, uh, alien spaceships. We're seeing uh, they're getting so common. Uh, we're going to be so complacent with it. It's not going to surprise us at all. And more and more people are seeing these Bigfoot creatures all over the world, uh, not just here, but <clears throat> all over. And uh, they're coming out and they're, they're being seen, and some of them are more human than they are fallen angels or whatever they might, whatever the core might have been at one time. And their trackways are different, uh, their their attributes are different, so it's just a uh, matter of being aware of who we are as human beings. We're very special. We did out, out form, outperform. Our capabilities are way up there, far as, further than we can even imagine. And we're going to reach those one of these days if we just learn how to raise our frequency. And uh, I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, but there are well, some malicious ones out there. I was getting ready to say, I feel like there's other things out there that don't want us to achieve that. Oh, absolutely, and I, yes. And I don't know how to, like... Again, I, I don't want to keep going back like to the real religion aspect to them, but like whatever these entities are, um, why would they not want us to? And again, I go back to if well, if they're the low vibration feeding on our negativity thing, that's why they don't want us to achieve anything because we're their food source at this rate. Like they're living off that energy, and then you some people say those are what the reptilians are. They mm -hmm. live underground. They feed off on our negative energy. They control everything. I was like, that's. I'm putting on my tinfoil hat here for going down the rabbit hole. But <laughs> like when you start going down these pathways, I'm like, man, that sounds crazy. But then the further you start to look into it, you're just like, now it starts to sound make, like it plausible. Like I could see that being a possibility. Like when I started doing this show years ago, I would have thought 99% of the stuff that I talked about was like straight up batshit crazy stuff. <laughs> but now it's like, I'm. Yeah, we couldn't that, do this a few years ago. We couldn't talk like this at all. I didn't. Yeah. You know, yeah, but finally the government opened it up to us. So they're only going to give us what we think we can handle, what they think we can handle. You know, as far mm -hmm. as facts go, they won't tell us everything. I just I've don't had, trust, trust. I've had it. a few episodes that got in trouble. I got banned on certain things, but <laughs> so, so far uh, I've only had a couple of issues. Well, all I ask people is to check it out. You don't have to believe a word I'm saying, but I'd have experienced these beings 
firsthand. I've commun- I, said, I didn't communicate with him, but I, I was conversing something with him. I was trying to mimic him that night. And I got it all recorded on one of my both my CDs actually. I got two CDs on my website, and uh, just uh, if you want to hear what they sound like, but I could have sent you some sounds you could play them. But it's just, uh, I'm in my 80s now. I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody. I just want people to understand who they are as human beings, made in the, made in the image of something very unique, the good Anunnaki's, because there's multitudes of them that are out there that didn't fall. They didn't take human density. Human density is uh, this third-dimensional environment. And uh, that's, yeah, there's other bad things that, you ever heard of the, uh, there's a cave in Vietnam, which was discovered years ago. It's, it's just got opened uh, here in 2013, I think it was, when they, uh, it's a huge cave, it's like it's the biggest one they've ever found in the world. And uh, I've seen photos of it, I don't know what it's called. It has Han Song Dong. I think mm. You can like feel like that. a skyscraper in it, I think they said. Oh, yeah, it. and it's six miles long. It's got its own ecosystem in it, everything, trees, water, mm. all that stuff. Well, there's been reports of uh, uh, reptilian-type bipedal beings being seen coming out of that cave, and by the locals, swear by it. And then you got the military in Vietnam when they were having missions over there, claims they shot that one. They think they missed it because it went back in the cave. But uh, we have a tendency to shoot things we don't understand. I uh, have... Try- <laughs> The reptilians are, are here because they want this earth. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything wants this earth. Well, this is a good earth. We got a, we have the cream of the crop here on this earth, cream of the solar system, I should say. It's got everything the other planets don't have. So aliens don't want us to destroy it. That's why we started seeing more UFOs, and that's why the government got involved in UFO stuff right after right after uh, Second World War when the atomic bomb went off. And that's that's kind of bothersome to them because that set out some warnings and that's why they're appearing more and they're interfering more which they're not really supposed to interfere with our karma that's why that's why well if they do they're obstructing our our graduation because we're supposed to respond to things on our own we're not supposed to tell other people what to do we're not supposed to judge other people for what they're doing we're not supposed to tell them what to do because you can tell them what you did that worked out or something like that and if they they want to go that way. It's going to be their choice. But everything on this planet has a choice, and uh, everything will always will have a choice. So, when we're talking about like they want the planet and everything, do you believe that like these? Where do they originally come from? If they're we're talking about different dimensions, that the different dimensions still revolve around our planet? Or are they from some completely yeah. different part well, of space? Uh, or? No, I think it has probably came from some other place outside of the cosmos. Uh, you got the Palladians, they talk about, which comes from the star system uh, of the Seven Sisters, I think it is. But you got a lot of uh, a lot of people that look into that deeper than even I have. And they, of course, some aliens have been captured and they cooperate with us because they, they want us to know more and they want us to not destroy the earth. And that's where a lot of the information is coming from, from the whistleblowers that have been working in Area 51 different places. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of stuff over my years and got to kind of take it all in and see what you want to digest, what fits right with, with your heart. If your heart will lead you in everything that's right. And I said a few years ago, any of this stuff to me, it might have been like, man, this is just straight up craziness. But anymore, I'm like, nope, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing surprises me anymore. I'll tell you that. In no. 2016, I was up there with my wife. She, her and I was in this little tent I set up and we saw this uh, elongated light go floating by us. And uh, that's a little concerning because you don't know what it's all about. You don't know what it's for. I didn't have nothing but my 38 p shooter, you know. And uh, not that I had a, but you don't know. It's a, it's a form of energy because it's manipulating its way through the trees, through the forest up there. We watched it until it went out of sight. But it didn't bother us. But nothing su- surprises me anymore. We've seen light, light anomalies up there, excuse me, before. But it's just, uh, what do you do with that? I mean, kind of just, I told people about it. It wasn't until 2018 when David Polites, uh he's a uh, missing 401 researcher yeah. with those books. Mm. Him and I are, are pretty good friends. And I, I, I took him and his videographer up to our camp, and uh, they recreated that 
uh, scene that showed just how fast it moved and followed my finger right along with a, a light anomaly, just like I described. And he put that in his uh, Missing 401, The Hunted uh, video, which I think is free now. If anybody wants to pick it up. No, I'm, in the, I'm, it. A, I'm in uh, 15 minutes of that. Oh, uh, just before the lady that's seen this uh, pixelization of a something energy moving from one tree to another. And speaking of trees, <laughs> I got a whole chapter on trees in my book. These things <laughs> don't like it when we mess with the trees, when we cut trees down. More reports over the years that I've taken and listened to about these things being seen when they're clear cutting or when they're cutting trees. And uh, they don't, no one seems to understand it because trees are nothing. They think, well, no, the trees is something. They, they have a root system that talks to other trees, their yeah. life form, their energy. And the Native Americans said they live in trees. Well, they're not the only ones that say that. I mean, I know two people who are very credible people, in my opinion. One's a professor, actually, who swears up and down. They, they come out of trees, and he's seen it. And uh, another lady that I know, she says the same thing. And they don't they don't go out together, by the way. <laughs> They're different. And uh and you got the native lawyers say they uh, they live in two worlds and they live in trees. Well, how can they live in trees? You know, that's why I changed my wood knock in two thousand eleven to a gunshot, maybe, going off outside my tent there. Because maybe the energy it takes, they thrive on energy. I got to tell you that. They, they kill your batteries. They, they did ours many times up there. Uh, if they live on energy, if they can change their matter through sound vibration, which is my theory, they could energize within a tree, which has life and has energy. And the root system goes down, 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 down. And I just think that's a pretty good theory. And... Uh, no one's going to prove it one way or the other. <laughs> yes, it's, unless Victor comes out and says, hey, watch me go into a tree. I'm going to go energize. <laughs> that would work. It's, it's funny that you mentioned like they drain like they, your batteries and they want your energy or whatever because I talked to someone the other day. I, I did an interview and we didn't actually dive into that. He wrote a book recently, but we didn't actually talk about some of the stuff from his book. We got sidetracked. But in the book, he said... Uh, People that have Bigfoot experiences, if this ever happened in their house, like all the stuff that people report, they'd be considered a poltergeist because there's certain aspects to people that have Bigfoot experiences that you would have with ghost experiences or whatever in your house. Like you hear noises, you're picking up stuff, your batteries are draining, your energy is draining, like certain things like people go ghost hunting. They said, oh, my camera just lost all of its battery power. Something just drained all the energy. Like... And a lot of that stuff does actually happen out when people are out looking for Bigfoot too. So there is kind of a weird correlation with some of the stuff. Yes, energy is uh, extremely, yes, valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Nelson, the cryptolingus, went up there with me a few times. He had his, he took up batteries and up to last for days, and they'd all be drained. Wouldn't be any good. And uh, you know, something's around. <laughs> Who knows how they yeah. do it? Uh, I think they need energy. A lot of signs around power lines and, and transformers. Uh, uh, I just think there's a definite, uh, they definitely use energy to uh, to either go out of our dimension or get into it, one or the other. That <clears throat> uh, sounds crazy. And if I said it 20 years ago, I'd been putting the plant on farm, but. <laughs> uh, after looking into it for so, so long and realizing what they could be and what they probably are, uh, you know, it's what's this earth, the people who say this earth is only 6,000 years old is that's how I was trained. Uh, yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. How do they explain was, dinosaur bones? You know, how do they explain that stuff? They claim those are the works of the devil. When I, oh, the church the that devil, I used to go yeah. to, one of the that's religion. <laughs> yeah. One of the people would say that, uh, because I, I would come from a Pentecostal family, so one of the people that were at that church, he was like he, the assistant pastor, whatever. He always says anything like bones, like dinosaur bones, or anything. They're all works of the devil to mislead man. They were only like six thousand years old. It says it right in the Bible, and I don't well, think the Bible gave a specific time frame. No, I, I got it written in my second book, just how that came about. 
But you know, just about everybody agrees it's looked into anything, especially the evidence that that it's twelve thousand years ago we had a we had a big shift in this earth, and uh, that's called the Younger Dryas, and uh, that puts it about uh, eight thousand years BCE. And, uh, that's, that's about the end of the Ice Age, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, things shifted. A lot of things shifted. And that's why you see these anomalies all over the earth that seemed like it had something in common, like the pyramids. And uh, you see those in Peru and Bolivia and all over. Uh, so there's something going on, has gone on for eons. I mean, I want to say hundreds of thousands of years, but I get right into possibly millions of years because we don't see time like, like time exists the way it really or it doesn't exist. It's just got to say that again. It's just everything is in the now. And that's hard to get your head around because uh, it really is. You got the what they call time travelers too, which according to physics, that's possible. But I think when you get in the fourth dimension, which is time, uh, you, can, you, can, you can see what everything is. You can see backwards, you can see forward. And possibly, if you want to correct your mistakes, you can get into a life that's uh, a little more promising for you. But that's called reincarnation. Churches, mm -hmm. at least a lot of Christian churches don't believe in that at all. But even Christ asked who who they thought he was. Was he Elijah or who was he? They believed in incarnation back reincarnation back then. And who was Melchizedek? If you really want to get into that. He was in the Old Testament, Abraham's priest. They think that might have been Christ here on earth at one time, uh, reincarnating. But it happens. I mean, it don't think it makes sense to if energy can't die, we all are energy at the most minute level of our existence. We are energy. Everything is. You find the frequency of that energy, which is vibrating, and you can change matter. There you are. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what um, CERN and some of these other accelerators are really trying to do is there are so many big conspiracies when it comes to like CERN <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. I talked to someone recently and he said CERN's trying to open a portal to hell to release Satan. I was like, well, I don't know if I believe that it's what they're doing, but the video they released when they first talked about it is very like, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it is very uh, strange video that CERN released on their own. Like it is got a lot of, I don't want to say evil looking like images or whatever, but it's very strange. I think they may have just played into the whole hype of people saying that's what they were doing. So they just kind of played it off tongue in cheek, like what they were doing. Well, they said something about the God particle, you know, and that kind of mm -hmm. threw everybody, especially religions, because no, no, it can't be that. Yeah. Well, what they meant by that was it's energy and God is energy. He's the highest form of, of a oneness. He's the, he's the creator of everything. I do believe in that. You know, there's just, don't, nobody get me wrong there. I believe in in, in a creator. And it's all intelligent. It's, it's above the ninth dimension. But the ninth dimension are entities, uh, alien entities. Some of them decided to take a third, third density form and drop down to Earth and start messing with the women here and creating hybrids. There's a lot of hybrids on this planet. I think it's just a training place for, for us to learn how to treat everything, how to be good with everything. I don't hunt anymore, and I, not that I wouldn't if I needed to eat, but I mean, I do need to eat. I'm mean, get away from that right quick. I love to eat, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. If we needed, yeah. if we needed to, to to survive, sure. But everything is energy, and it's just going to change and go somewhere else. And the last deer I shot up at the Sierras when I finished hunting was, I, I went over to it and it died right in front of me. I just seen his eyes glaze over, and he just felt something leave it. And I felt something leave it, and that that sounds ridiculous, but it's energy left. And I don't want to, uh, well, I get into that stuff, but it's it's really, there's more going on than what meets our two eyes and what's been training our little brain up on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. For anyone we're... listening, I'm, I'm not a hunter and I don't kill things. <laughs> so, like, I, I saw a lot of people that I know, they're terrified of snakes so if they see a snake they want to kill and i'm the person I'm like i'm not afraid of so i'll try and save the snake and <laughs> move it somewhere else <laughs> I, I think the snake's got a bad rap and a lot of it's because of religion well that's true but reptilians yeah 
someone pointed that out recently on in an interview. They said that uh, when the Garden of Eden, the snake was uh, standing up talking to Eve and influenced her, and then God punished them by making them crawl on their belly. So that means they used to walk. Like, what does that sound like? It sounds like a reptilian. I was like, I mean, yeah. I never, I, I never thought of that, but <laughs> it kind of does. So. But also big, you know, they were big, and mm -hmm. what they when they crossbred with uh, with uh, the troglodytes, which are cavemen, and they, you know, they crossbred with them, they created giants called the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. And you've heard of that. I was raised in Pentecostal area too. I've been to that one, been Baptist, you know, several of them. And finally, I just got to an interdenominational church, which just taught love and compassion. I like that one. But still, mm -hmm. it's religion. It wants to control you uh, through the Hebrew Bible, which is translated into Greek uh, in the New Testament. And uh, you just got to look into it more. Everybody does. And I just encourage, you don't have to believe a word I'm saying here, but encourage you all to look deeper into how things really are. They're not as they appear to be. And there's things all around you right now that you don't see that's there. And if you look for the negative, you'll find the negative, and it'll come into your life. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that. I had a very strange warning when I first started doing the podcast, and they, they're basically uh, quoting Nietzsche or whatever, how you pronounce the guy, but basically said, if you look into the abyss, sometimes the abyss stares back or whatever it was the but this person told me sometimes when you start looking into things, things start looking back. I never <laughs> took I never took a whole lot of stock into that, but there has been some weird things that have happened ever since I've started this show. I was like, I wonder if it's my fault for going down these rabbit holes now I'm bringing in some weird energies around my own house. Well, what you put out is what you're going to get back, so just start thinking about the good stuff. Yeah. And you'll be I, healthy too, by the way. i got to say, you'll be healthy. Uh, it do, helps. I do feel like I'm trying, because I... A lot of the interviews I have are people have had experiences and they don't want, I didn't want people to feel like I did because for 15 years, I never talked to anyone about what I saw because crazy, who's going to believe you, you know, like, so I want to talk to people that had similar experiences that had like strange happenings or anything like that, that they felt like they couldn't talk about. Yeah. And I feel like it's therapeutic for myself and it's helped. If someone listening hears them, they don't feel so, well, I had something weird happen to me. And the guest you're talking to, they've had some weird experiences, so they want to talk about it. So my thing is I'm trying just to give a place for people to come on here and feel like they can actually talk about something strange that happened to them that I'm not here to ridicule them or prove or disprove anything. Like, I'm just here to let them talk. Good. That's great. There's a lot of people would talk about it, but they don't want to just like you, like we didn't for a long time. We just we just played the sounds to people and talked about what went on at camp, not the strange stuff, just just about um, Bigfoot's vocalizations, you know. And we didn't talk about how important it was and what they didn't talk about that stuff we've been talking about tonight. But that's because uh, we've been laughed at and scoffed at too much. And I was a businessman, like the other guys were too, and we kind of held this position in, in the social area in our towns and. He just didn't uh, didn't want to be made fun of. I don't know when I moved out of California years ago. One or the other, anyway, went up to Washington, and some up there heard I was involved in Bigfoot, so they came into my house. I had a three story house, a little uh, mansion, really, and the refurbishing. If you ever want to go into a really deep subject, try to re refurbish an old Victorian house. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, this uh, reporter thought they'd come and interview me. You know, Bigfoot's kind of a big deal in Washington. So she came up there and she got to sit down in my office. And so let's hear about so I said, so of us. By the way, I've talked to them. And boy, she got she got up and left. Because <laughs> <laughs> they've got to be a primate. Everybody's been taught that they're an ape in the woods, you know. And, and they're more than that. What we ran into is more than that, a lot more than that. And uh, I just got to say that... Uh, these guys out there beating on trees and screaming the night and yelling and stuff like that. You might get their attention or you might wake them up one or the other if you hit on a tree. <laughs> Don't know. But I know trees are important to them. <clears throat> and uh, if you're looking for the ape in the woods, uh, good luck on that one. Unless you're lucky, like Patterson was. But what Patterson saw in you know, Roger Patterson, the, the Bluff Creek film, that uh, 
I think that was a more of a hybridization, uh, diluted down Bigfoot. Uh, so I've got a track from that trackway, and it doesn't look like ours. Ours is five-toed, but they're very a lot bigger, and they're splayed. And what we have has language. I'm not sure they all have that attribute. I don't know if it's been recessed in a lot of them, or they just weren't given that when whatever the created them created them. So I've I often know. wondered if there's another because there's different versions of Bigfoot sat, whatever you want to, like in different areas that they're described as looking different. I've heard some people say they look more humanized in the face, like different type of nose. Mm -hmm. Like some say they look more like almost Native American face, like very humanish. Yeah. So, so I've wondered if there's like different offshoots to where in certain areas they've adapted differently oh sure could be yeah absolutely but keep in mind this hasn't just happened six thousand years this has happened over thousands of years mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of time just for a, a mutation to take effect in a, in a species so yeah i think that's very possible because you don't know what intelligence made them what what entity might have created them you don't know how much they've been diluted down but the native lore goes way back on these things, taking their women. And uh, you hear about that just about every tribe I've talked to. And there's not a tribe that I've talked to that has this. It's hard to get them to talk to you, number one. But once once they do converse with us white guys, well, <laughs> they, they do tell you some stuff. I've been invited to a couple of sweat lodges, too. But for some reason or another, I couldn't make it. And, uh, it's it's It's... Interesting to listen to these people's lore because they guess this is what all of them talk about beings from the sky, the Hopi. Uh, they talk about the sky people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, all cultures have that. Uh, in China and all, they they got those those stories that come down from ancient times and says we were visited by sky people. And, and then you got the Book of Enoch, you know, which he was carried away in a chariot of fire. Well, come on, sounds like a UFO. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. No, I've always, again, finding people that are open to this. I, I've always liked talking about stuff like this. I grew up as a kid in the '90s, li loving the X Files. So to me, that's I've got the thing right behind me that I, from <laughs> I want to believe. But I've always been interested in this type of stuff. But I never took a whole lot of stock into thinking it was actually real. I wanted it to be real. And then when you see something, I didn't even know what a dog man was. I don't ever tell people I saw dog man because I say I saw an upright walking canine because I still struggle saying dog man's real, mm -hmm. but I know what I saw. I was 15 feet <laughs> from it. And I would just, suggest one thing where you should interview the deputy that went out with me, uh, that took me out into the land of between the lakes where he saw one face to face. Martin. He's been Martin Groves. I've actually wanted to talk with Martin. He's a yeah. great man. He's a good person and he's a very honorable and very believable person. And yeah, that would, that would help because those mm -hmm. people that, that have seen this stuff, they just don't want to come out and tell anybody because of yeah. the ridicule they might have. I don't care myself. You know, I just don't care. I'm in my eighties now. And, you know, I can go anytime. I don't care. I know where I'm going. At least I think I do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's what's important to me. I just want to get the word out of, of who we are as humans and, and what I think these things could be and my experience with them. And before I get loose from you here, I, I want to make sure people, my website is ronmorehead.com. And uh, that's all. The, all, the, all three of my books are available on that site, and so are my two CDs. The downloads are available too, and the downloads on my books or the paperback. Any of them. But I I'll write about sure stuff we've been talking. So I'll include all that in the show notes for anyone that's interested. I'll make sure to put all that in there for them. Oh, uh, thank you. Right. Yeah, it's just uh, I just want the word out. It's not like I'm trying to make a bunch of money on this stuff. I'm not. I spent a fortune. I used to have on airplanes and have be able to travel anywhere I want to go. I've been all the way all over Alaska. I've gone down in South America. I've been all over doing doing fun stuff and researching too. But now I got to go commercially because I've sold airplanes and and uh, I just uh, 
I don't like uh, flying commercial anymore. <laughs> and I've been doing a lot of it the last few years. So they might have given all this up this year. No. After this year. They said, been, how many years traveling. have you been doing this? No, over 50, hasn't it? Yeah, I started in 71. Well, started studying in 71. I didn't start doing this till a few years later when we got Dr. Curlin's report mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, range these things have with the vocal mechanism. But so much superior to ours. So they've been given an attribute there that we don't have uh, in their vocal mechanism. I heard one guy tell me, and he was supposed to be an intuitive, say they have... They have more than two vocal cords. We have two. And uh, of course, one of their uh, one of the sounds I got recorded is a whistle. And it's been studied that the whistle was done through the vocal mechanism, not through the lips like we do. And if they if they can if they've got all these different vocal cords, they could probably create any sound they wanted to. But unfortunately, we weren't recording anything but cassette recorders, which just, just do certain frequencies. <clears throat> we had lined up with a uh, a researcher, a physicist, a, a doctor of infrasound back east or somewhere. And she records infrasound on big animals, you know, tigers and, and uh, elephants. And <clears throat> she uh, wanted to help us out. So she said, well, I have, I have equipment that'll, that'll you could set up and we could pick up infrasound. If we're doing infrasound. Well, that would be great. So before she would do anything, she wants to, she wanted to hear the sounds and we sent her, sent her the sounds, and she heard what she thought was some English phrases in there. And there are English phrases in there, but that's because they could speak inside our our vocal mechanism, inside our well, our limitations as humans. And she said, I think they're phony. Well, she didn't do any study at all. She's supposed to be a scientist. You know? She kept her $2,500. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you can record it for sound, and... Uh, Ultrasound, too, probably, but we didn't have any of that equipment back in the 70s. We wasn't thinking that way anyway. Yeah. Well, back then, I think even within the last 15 years, for the most part, anyone, when you think of a Bigfoot, you're thinking primate. Yeah. It's not been up until, like I said, 10 or 15 years now is when the whole... I didn't even know anything about interdimensional. Anyone actually thought Bigfoots were interdimensional up until I started doing podcasting two years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's like, like I said, I was never into the whole communities or looking into things too much or whatever. I just like, I saw some weird shit and I'm just like, whatever. I'm going to try to write it off and not go down that rabbit hole. Well, I think when but, they see them in the pickleization form, they're, they're transferring from a uh, 3d on up to something else. They've mm -hmm. seen them in the fourth dimension of time. Uh, I know some very credible people that have seen that very thing. And uh, I never saw it myself, but then we didn't see as many of them as we thought we should have up there, as close as they were to our shelter, as close as they were to us. Sometimes we, we should have seen them. I mean, they were within feet of us outside that shelter. And you jump out there and you should have seen something, but you didn't. Now, we all got glimpses occasionally. That was rare. I mean, it wasn't until 74 when I started interacting with them outside the shelter that I actually saw one. And so did Bill, my, my partner that was up there with me. He packed some supplies in. And it was just the two of us there, and they started making that. I write about that in my first book, uh, Boys in the Wilderness, my chronicle. And it comes, by the way, and I've mentioned this, and there was a, a link where you can download the sound I'm talking about when I get to the context of it. You can hear the sound, which is pretty popular. But these are all available on on my website, ronmoorhead.com. Keep throwing that in, don't I? <laughs> mm -hmm. I just want the word out there, you know. No, I I get it. I think we can probably wrap this up, but I want you to talk a little bit about your newest book and where everyone, like we've mentioned your website, and like I said, I'll put the links in the show notes for you, but you want to let everyone know about your latest book that just came out? Yeah, it's um, it's called uh, Bigfoot Unveiled. And it's, it's a little deeper into uh, some of the mysteries behind, like the subtitle, Scientific Answers to Bigfoot Mysteries, and gets a little deeper into well, some of the things I wrote in my second book, which was a quantum Bigfoot. But it, uh, it's got a uh, manifestation code of Tesla, which is a 369, dimensions, different dimensions, uh, how they cloak, can they cloak, how does that work? Yes, there's a science behind that. 
I try to stay with science on all this stuff. Uh, intervention of karma is another chapter. Hybridization, uh, levitation, tree, artificial intelligence. We didn't talk about that, but that's that's very important. People understand what that's all about. The subtitle of that is The Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, well, it's not. There's more, but forwards by David Polites. He wrote the forward for me. And uh, anyway, these are all on my website. You can see them there too. Mm. Now, like I said, I'll make sure to include all of that in the show notes for anyone out there listening to get in contact with you, order a book, or whatever it is they're wanting to do. It'll Thank be you. Easy for them to do that. Thank you. Yep, not a problem, Ron. I want to say thanks to you because it's been a pleasure talking with you. You were well, thank you. You were one of the people that were on my podcast bucket list, so I can so I got to talk to you. You were <laughs> I said this earlier at the beginning, you've been kind of one of the godfathers of the Bigfoot community. So it's been an well, honor to talk with you. I definitely appreciate you coming on here. Call me the gray back of gray back of primates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you take care, Brandon. Yep, you take thank care you. too. Thank you. Good night. And that's the show, everyone. I really hope you guys enjoyed the conversations. If you would like to be a guest on Tinfoil Tells, remember to send an email to tinfoiltellspodcast at gmail.com or go to the contact section of tinfoiltells.com to get your message to me. We'll get something scheduled for a future episode. And just remember, the truth lies in the stories we share, the connections we make. Stay curious, stay open-minded. Thank you all for joining us on this journey. And until next time, keep questioning, keep seeking, and keep exploring the unknown. Good night, everyone. Tinfoil tales in the headphones. Yeah, it's time to rock. Got a story about a cryptic creature. Let's take a walk. Bigfoot dogmen. They're out there in the dark. But the truth is out there like an alien spark. UFO sightings got the whole world shook. Conspiracies unfold like a story in a book. Media control. Keep us blind, but oh, 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 oh before we're gonna use my own mind. In history, they don't want us to know the secrets they hide, the truth they won't show. Darling, our society, they keep us in chains. But I'm standing tall, it's time to break the reins. Trying to keep us blind But I won't, won't be fooled Gonna use my own mind